Hey everyone, and welcome again to my audiovisual channel. My name is Gabriella Handel, and I'm a draftsman and also the host of this show, A Conversation About Art. During each episode, I look for the meaning of art and beauty through conversations with colleagues in different artistic fields. Today, I offer you episode 76, and I will talk with artist Robert Florjak. If you'd like to support this podcast, you can do so by liking and sharing this video and also by subscribing to my audiovisual channel. These are all immediate and at no additional cost to you. If you'd like to show your support with money, it's also very welcome and appreciated. You can do so by purchasing my drawings directly from my website, which is GabriellaHandle.com, just one word. You can purchase crafts I make from eBay, by prints of my drawings, or you can leave me a tip. The links for all these things will be in the video description or caption. Thank you for your time and attention in watching this episode, and do leave a comment so I know you were here. I hope you enjoy it. Okay, Robert Florjack, thank you very much for agreeing to talk to me today. You are episode 76 of A Conversation About Art. Please tell our future uh, listeners and viewers who you are and what you do. I am Robert Florzak. Uh, grew up on the East Coast uh, of, uh, of the U.S. in New Jersey, New York area, and uh, later on moved out to Los Angeles, where I was most of my life, and uh, six years ago moved to Germany, where I am now. Um, most of my career was as, a, um, as an illustrator, uh, doing books and movie posters and album covers and that kind of thing. I had a second career during much of that in the early days as a recording artist. Um, can't do both, really. Um, they get very competitive. And at some point, uh, I was getting much more work. Um, and the career was moving f forward a lot faster in art, so I, I kind of retired from the music eventually. And in recent years, I've also been writing. So I've got uh, sort of like three different careers going. And that's where we are now. Okay. Um, yes. Do you, I mean, do you consider these, I mean, these things are three mediums of expression, of artistic expression. Mm -hmm. uh, would you, I mean, do you think of them as like similar to, you know, some people draw and paint and sculpt, some people draw and paint, and some people use acrylic or oil paint or something. I mean, you know, does, does that seem right? Like different means of expression? I, th I think, I think in, in more general terms, you, you might be right. It's not as specific, it's not as closely connected as the examples you gave within uh, visual art. But, but there is that that similar component of being creative. I mean, that's, mm. that's basically what you can tie it all together with. I, I, I don't know if I think in the same way if I'm, if I'm making music, which I still do now, or creating artwork or even writing, um, other than getting the creative juices flowing in general. I, some, I, I don't think there's a lot of similarities. There are some now and then, especially music and art. The writing is a whole different thing. So I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, I, I guess I guess in the end, it's a, the, the commonality is just coming up with something, uh, you know, creatively out of nowhere, mm -hmm. and getting out there, whether it's on paper or canvas or sheet music. Yeah. Okay. But what do you think? What do you think is the impetus for the different three ones? Because it's like, what kind of stuff? It's like, do you do you feel like you have different themes that you talk about? when you make visual art versus when you make music versus when you write it's like what why do you sometimes want to write why do you sometimes want to make music and why do you why do you sometimes want to paint that's a good question i think in some ways for me personally it's a curse and what that what that curse is is i've just been incredibly interested in a lot of things to the point where it, it becomes a passion and i have to do it i can't mm -hmm. just watch it from the outside um, and that's, that's really what it comes down to. The interests are very varied and very strong. And so I don't, I don't, I don't feel comfortable staying in one, um, in one of those categories. It's literally that, it's just wanting to do it, wanting to do everything. And so I set about doing it, whatever it is. And I'm, I'm in a, a fortunate 
position that I can, um, especially these days. So, uh, and so I do. And I just, I just basically now just bounce back and forth from project to project. I, I just finished that. Uh, I, uh, I mentioned earlier to you on the side that I just finished a book on art. Um, that's pretty much out of the way. And I'm going back now into the studio to, to finish some paintings that have been on the drawing board for a while as I've been writing. And I want to finish those and then back to the recordings uh, that I've been working on. And so okay. that's it, bouncing around. Okay. Um, all right. So, um, how do you end up writing a whole, it's like, how long is this book? Uh, this one is, this one's 200 pages. Um, okay. the previous book, the Errol Flynn book was 300, 320 pages. Um, but this one, although it's 200 pages on art, um, a lot of it, a lot of it is full page images mm. of art itself. So it's not as if it's a, a text packed 200 pages. Did you illustrate it too? No, no, no. Ah, okay. This is a, this is a book. Um, I haven't, I haven't fully decided on a title yet, which is unusual for me. I usually come up with these things even before, you know, moving forward. But it's basically a, a guide to judging quality. Oh. And it's, it's like the anti-opinion book. Uh -huh. That in the last century or so, the idea of opinion has, has uh, become the god of, of the arts. That opinion is, is what it's all about. And when in mm -hmm. fact, for centuries and centuries, it was the last thing that was determined uh, that, w that was used to determine quality in art, that there were actual ways of gauging and judging the quality of a piece, um, a piece of art. And this book is kind of a call to go back to that type of thing for the, mm -hmm. for, for the survival of art, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, for the survival mm -hmm. of great art, I should say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and uh, yeah, ar arguably, for the survival of, I don't know, our sanity. <laughs> yeah, especially um, if you're in the arts, it, it really tests your sanity, as you it, probably know. Yeah, I mean, it, it does, but I mean, I, I personally can't say that I know necessarily the connection between a society and like the art of its time or something, but I have, wa I have listened and watched to a video here and there that say something of the sort about how the art produced by a, a society in its time is kind of like, kind of like its pulse or something, you know, I mean, it, mm -hmm. it talks about the health of the society or something like this. Yeah. And if it's just like a ridiculous work, uh, then, you know, something might be wrong or something. <laughs> oh, sure. As I mentioned in some point near the end of my book, it'll be interesting. It would be interesting to know what future societies will think of us when they look back on our art from this time period compared to right. us looking back 400, 500 years to the Renaissance and seeing the, the work that was produced then. Right. The night, and, night and day difference, complete difference. And yeah. as, as I write in this, in this book, one, one of the themes about that is that there's a reason that this happened mm -hmm. and it shouldn't have. Yes. Uh, I don't know if you want to go into what the reason is because uh, it's going to be in the book, but. Oh, sure. I, I will. Sometimes, sometimes okay. I, I, I try to be as concise as I can in these answers. Sometimes it's a little bit more complex than a, than a simple answer. But um, from, the, from the late 19th century, almost the mid 19th century, with the advent of the Impressionists bucking against the tide of the academies, um, that started the ball rolling away from the idea that skill was at the center of quality and art. Mm -hmm. And skill became less and less and less the core, not only the core of art, but the core of determining uh, the qual of quality and art to the point mm -hmm. where ideas now alone can be considered the art and skill is, is almost totally irrelevant to the enterprise. Uh-huh. And, but, but why did they, what, what made them think this way, do you think? Well, nobody thought that way in the moment. 
it was, it was, it was a gradual thing that happened. I mean, all you have to do is just, you know, look at, look at a basic timeline of art from the 1860s to the present, and you'll see the, the evolution of art uh, movements and how they become um, shorter and shorter and shorter yeah, because yeah. tension span and, and boredom and that type of thing, and, and less and less about showing um, artistic aesthetic skills. And it's, it's part of human nature that skill requires effort right. and knowledge. And human nature um, does not easily accept uh, effort. Right. So as things opened up and more and more art was being accepted that didn't require that amount of skill as it used to, and could even get to the point where the idea itself was enough to promote the art, this opened up the floodgates of anybody, uh, anyone, anybody who, who had ideas to actually create what would be considered art. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so it, was only, it, was only, it was only a matter of time before that would happen when, when, when the idea of skill was not at the center of what art, artistic quality was. You just come up with an idea and promote it. And if you had a gallery or hopefully even a museum behind you, uh, the rest is history for you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. Um, okay. Um, does that, I mean, does it, did that clarify it for you? It, it does. Yes, it does. It does clarify. Um, yes. So around the 1800s, we're talking, I mean, that was, that's around, I mean, the salon, the French salon was around that time, right? Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, sure. And, and, and there was, there was the equivalent in England also. And right. the, that was the, that was, they both started, the, the, those things started at the end of the 18th century. And they were very strong by the mid to late 19th century. Okay. And, and it, it, because of the revisionist history in art history since the early 20th century, those things were, are now looked down upon right. as being the bad guys, when in fact they weren't. They, they, were, they were the gatekeepers, a phrase I used earlier, um, of, of excellence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they were, they were run by artists themselves who understood what went into create, what, uh, what went into what was necessary uh, to create great art. Yeah. And, you know, using the phrase again about human nature, it was only human nature that uh, there'd finally be a, a group of artists who just didn't want to live up to those expectations and those demands and, and wanted to do it their own way. And uh, they broke off uh, and mm -hmm. did their own thing. And it was really looked down upon for a long time. Right. Uh, the, the public and the, the public, the critics and the art community itself uh, did not did not approve of this kind of thing. And it was only after long um, promotional attempts on the part of the handful of people that would be buying up this art that was very unprofessional, very unskilled and promoting it to the public. It took decades before the public started changing their mind and accepting what was being basically propagandized um, that they started accepting and then, and then once that once that happened uh, and it started to change the economics of the art world it became almost purposeless for the great masters of the time who were being ignored to continue on this way because it was just destroying their market it, a, a an art dealer in the, in the 1890s and, and first uh, decade of the 20th century stood to make a hell of a lot more money uh, unloading hundreds of modern pieces and having hundreds because they, they, those pieces could be done so quickly mm. than representing an artist who maybe took a month or two to create one, uh, one single work. Mm -hmm. It became an economic thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, all right. Uh, this this kind of stuff has definitely come up in the conversations uh, in the podcast before. And okay, so tell me what you think about this. Um, so it's like different sets of problems with 
both or you know arguably different sets of problems with both situations because for example um i don't know i personally don't know if i would have liked the rigorousness of the time of the salon for example like the i call the beaux-arts and this stuff like the demand that they had and how you had to um, i think you know not not that dissimilar from the atelier where you first draw for a year you only draw casts then you start painting like this type of a uh, very very specific steps that you take mm -hmm. to make sure that you learn certain things mm -hmm. okay so i don't know if i would personally have liked or would like that type of study mm -hmm. however I am very aware of the unbelievable things that were made thanks to that. Um, so, so um, you know, rules are there. I mean, the, you know, the constraints are there and they might be kind of annoying, but they are what allow the person, you know, the individual to make these unbelievable things. So like I am aware that they are, they are there for a good reason. Sure. Um, and at the same time, even though I dislike lots of things about the current status of the art world um like you know the stuff in the momas and whatever it is like that kind of trash um at the same time it is that's it this you know those circumstances are what allow me to be able to draw whatever i want and then make it possible for me to sell it so it's like there's kind of like this freedom there that perhaps might not have been there in the same way under the circumstances in the salon. So like, what do you think about this? Uh, well, well, there, 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 there are different things that you're bringing up there in a sense. First of all, I believe there's room for everything. There's a secondary issue to the, this whole evolution that's particularly sad. And that was that it was, it was not enough for the, for the new art and the people behind the new art to promote their artists. They needed to bury the contemporary, the con contemporaneous masters at the time, at the same time, which was, which was very sad and very unnecessary. They, they started to promote um, through, through uh, articles and critiques and everything, um, stories about, about these artists and whatnot that just almost destroyed their careers. And it was very sad that that it, that that the centuries-old tradition of of high art had to die, so that modernists could do their work when it didn't have to be. I mean, right. the, the, you, you bring up the idea of the of the of the, of the, of the um, you know, like the uh, Beaux Arts and all that. Uh, those those were just for competitions. They, they weren't telling every artist what they needed, how they needed to paint. Mm. Uh, you, you could you could paint whatever you wanted to paint and if, you found, if you could find an audience for it to buy it okay um, you know that that would be fine but but that's the sad part of it is that these great masters were continuing to try to produce work of a of, of very high level that had been done for centuries and they were really just knocked down by the by the prevailing uh, new art establishment and and that it didn't have to be that way mm. and now you might know this i mean there, there's still great art being produced out there it's just that you don't see it you don't hear about it because it doesn't get the uh it doesn't it, it doesn't get the light of day from the art establishment mm. the art establishment wants to you know go with the, the the newest most cutting edge most provocative often the most insulting you know yeah. that kind of so it's it's out there. It's just it's just it's on its own, and it didn't. It, right. it shouldn't have had to be that way. I think they could have gone hand in hand. N n the academies and the, uh, the the big ateliers were not step quashing uh, other kind of art. As I point out in my book, for instance, this idea there, there's a there's a the myth the mythology that what the impressionists did was show that you could you could do fresh painting with with um, fast brush strokes and loose color and you know loose and, and painting on location and all this kind of stuff well that had been done for centuries anyway it's just right. that those were right. studies mm. uh, and and those artists did never wanted to show studies as finished work but right. they did that kind of work 
all along. So the only difference was that the, the first impressionists were kind of complaining that their study oriented work wasn't being taken uh, seriously by the academy. But that's not what the academy's purpose was for. Right. It, yeah, okay. it was to showcase the best of, of, of those who did want to follow in those steps that you were talking about, which is similar to if you want to be a ba great ballet dancer, you've got to go through all those early stages right. and steps so that your body, you know, develops gets and gets used to it and, and can then do the things that a ballet dancer is going to be required of, to doing. Right. You can't just uh, dance on your own in the street and then expect to be um, accepted into the Bolshoi. It just it doesn't work yeah. that way. But nobody yeah. is stopping you, and nobody was stopping anyone back then from dancing or painting in the street. Right, right, okay. Yeah, it reminds me actually of what I was complaining about when before we started recording about uh, the students in my school in, at the academy that were complaining about how the school was teaching anatomy, and it's like the anatomy right. the the school says what they teach on the website, right. and then you you accept right. it to go to the website, and it's like if you didn't want to deal with whatever the Ecole de Beaux Arts was doing, then don't go there. <laughs> Exactly. You know. and, and, uh, that yeah. was, and that was that, that, that organization's purpose. Right. The, the okay. public at large was expecting to see at their annual exhibit the best that there was in their culture. Hmm. And so, so the, 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 those academies were maintaining that high level of, uh, uh, of discipline. And, and these new rebels were just kind of stomping their foot and saying, well, we want to be part of that too. Like we want to be, a, we, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's it's exactly the same analogy as what you're just saying about the art schools. Um, they knew what the academy required to be in those annual shows, and if you can't abide by those expectations, then you know, so be it. Right. Okay. 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 Mm -hmm. And by the way, some of some of them, would, you know, each year uh, would be accepted. Um, that's another myth. I mean, it, it, they they were not 100% uh, rejected year after year. They weren't. Some of them had pieces that managed to pass muster of a certain level of quality and uh, mm. subject matter and whatnot, and, and they did get in. But it's. Uh, it, it's it's very sad. It's, it's, it's not only sad all the things that has that have happened since then. It's also sad about the, um, as I mentioned, the uh, revisionist history since then. It's been re written in ways um, to make one think that what happened back then was other than what really did. Right. Yeah. It's yeah. It's definitely a little bit frustrating, or one ha or rather one has to be discerning when reading about certain things, mm -hmm. uh, because it, it's like. I hardly ever look at Wikipedia, for example, except for some few things because it's so contaminated with certain uh, biases. Sure. And it's like you know, I I don't I I, I don't want to know about this. I want to know what happened. Mm -hmm. It's like mm -hmm. I don't want to know what you think happened because uh, women or something. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and mm -hmm. it's yeah, it's pretty pretty irritating. I think one of the last things that I read regarding art history. Uh, was about the pre-Raphaelites, and what I read was um, the founding guy, uh, Holman Hunt, I think William it was. Hunt, one of the three. Yeah, Holman, yeah. yeah, he wrote two volumes on the pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, and I was like, yes, right from the mouth of the horse. It, this is what I'm talking about. Like, this is what I want. Sure. Um, and yeah, that's very, very different. Um, okay. And by yes. the way, uh, they they are an absolute personal favorite of mine. That that short era that they actually existed, uh, they were they were rebelling against the academy, the the British mm -hmm. academy. Yeah, yeah. The irony is, in hindsight, they were much closer to the to the aspirations and goals of the academy than what came later on. Were they if they had been able to see what the future was was going to be? Right. They were they were only they were rebelling by degree. They, they they weren't they weren't they didn't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater as as the impressionists did. They wanted to just the impressionists wanted to just turn the whole thing on its head. Mm. The, the pre raphaelites were just they they wanted to get back to uh, a, a realistic observation of of the world 
within certain subjects. They were very mm -hmm. big on religious and Arthurian subjects and things like that. And the Academy, the British Academy at that point had gotten into a neoclassical vein. So these were just style, just slight stylistic differences. But, but they both um, embodied absolute high-end skill. In oh, fact, yeah, for sure. one, one, of the three, one of the other three founders, um, John Everett Malays, ended up becoming he the president of the Royal Academy. He, oh, he was a prodigy. Yeah. But here he was, one of the pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood founding members, rebelling against the, the Royal Academy, later becoming the president of the Royal Academy. So it, yeah, was, yeah. it was an easy step from the one, the one realm to the other because they were really that close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I think, yeah, um, yeah, they were, they were very critical of the methods of the, of the Royal Academy. And they were like full on, you know, working from life and observing from life. It was very much, very much, it, it, it just occurred to me that it reminds me a lot of uh, Leonardo da Vinci because Leonardo was like all about like experiencing stuff yourself. Yes. So like, you know, right, and right. being the student of nature, you know, via yeah. observation. Right. Um, so yeah. And, and, like and autopsies and whatnot. Yeah. 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 Do, yeah. Drawing right from the grass, right from the bird, right from the carcass, right from the, you know, study the thing directly. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and, um, I think an, another thing that I really liked about the reading about the pre-Raphaelite brotherhood was how they busted their ass working. Uh, oh. because that, that's a, that's a stigma, uh, against which I have, you know, I continue to fight. Uh, the stigma of like the starving artist and the um, lazy artist, uh, promiscuous, drunk, whatever. Um, and I, I don't really understand why it is that the tragic artist of that flavor is so prevalent versus the fact that very many artists that worked really hard to, you know, make a career, maintain a career, to make good work, they existed as well, you know. Sure. I, don't, I don't really understand why... Um, I always have the impression that, or so many people seem to have the impression that it's really, you know, like a sparse life, you know, oh, just drifting through life, <laughs> you know. <laughs> that time period was actually very exciting. I mean, there was so much great art going on between 1850 and, and, 19, and uh, 1900. That, that whole time period, be, whether it was in Britain or the continent, some, and, and also, by the way, in the East, all the way out into Russia, fantastic art. Again, that was eclipsed by the art history um, literature that would come afterwards that just ignored it. I mean, uh, William Bouguereau was the preeminent painter of the second half of the, tw of the 19th century, the most successful artist of that entire half century. Mm. And he's totally ignored in all of the major art history books, totally. You, yeah. you won't even, you, uh, Jansen, uh, you, you know the H.W. Jansen history of art? The yeah. giant uh, doorstop of, a, of an art history book? He's not even mentioned in there. Mm. Not even mentioned. And I mean, he's just one. I mean, there, there are many, sure. many of them. Uh, and, and of course, the academic painters of Eastern Europe, um, uh, in, in Czechoslovakia, for instance, great work was coming out of there, great work coming out of Poland. I have a lot of these artists uh, shown in my book. Mm. Uh, and Russia, I mean, Russia was a huge um, source of phenomenal, high quality execution art, back to skill again, mm. that is totally ignored because they just, they just push, got pushed into the shadows in the early 20th century and were left there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, all right. Uh, Mr. Florzak, what is art in your opinion? Um. I basically start my book out <laughs> with uh, with a, a definition, and, uh -huh. I, and I mentioned how it's it's a lot simpler than a lot of writers will try to make it. It's not that difficult at all. Art is to, to, to quote myself: "Art is the visually creative depiction of an idea or an emotion." Okay, that's it, and I choose those words very very carefully. It's the visually creative, mean, visually meaning it must be visual because that's what art is. Every medium, okay. every medium has a basic uniqueness to it. Uh, music is not visual. Art is a visual medium. 
it must be creative. Um, otherwise, uh, you know, you put together a, a, a slide presentation for a business meeting, that's visual, but it's not art because it's not, it's not, the purpose of it is not its pure creativity. It's functional. Mm. It's functional the way a traffic sign is functional. Mm -hmm. So it's the visually creative depiction of an idea and or emotion. Now the emotion part of it really as a, as a, as a soul item, because I do say, and, or really only showed itself in the 20th century. The in, emotion in, part? Yeah. If, in other words, I say it's an idea and, or emotion, but if it's, or emotion, meaning only an emotion um. that really only showed itself, uh, or, or came about in the 20th century, basically in the form of, uh, abstract art. Mm because there's there's not there's not a representational marker in abstract art so so it uh -huh. pretty is an emotional issue there mm -hmm. rather okay. rather than specifically an idea you know uh, up until then through, throughout in the entire history of the arts uh, you were seeing the depiction of an idea whether it was um, uh, you know biblical or mytho mythological or historical or literary or those kinds of things you know mm -hmm. with, with, an idea that was depicted visually creatively but then uh depicting emotion kind of got into the uh into the, into play also mm -hmm. is, is that does that make sense to you it does make sense yeah um okay and and by the way and by using this very very simple i i i, I went through and over the years i've gone through so many books with giving uh the definitions and explanations of what art is and, and, and becomes so verbose and, and, yeah. and it, it includes so many things that it gets to the point where anything and everything is art, which of course, if, it, if that's true, then nothing is art. So I right. try to, over a long period of time, I try to, to pare it down to its absolute basis, basics. Mm -hmm. And you can then apply this, this definition then very easily to anything that's being claims to be art and see if it, it passes the test so so for instance very often starting with conceptual art you've got nothing more than an idea mm -hmm. and if it's only the idea how is it visually creative mm -hmm. if 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 you, if you can derive pretty much everything creative from the from the work itself from its from its written description then it's failed as a, as a visual medium. Right. Yeah. Okay. As I point out in the book, I've heard this a number of times from people, you know, there's a lot of art um, created in modern times. You know, you don't even have to see it and you'll know it's good. Well, that's, that's not something to be proud of. <laughs> if right. you're an artist, you know? Yeah. That's a, that sounds terrible. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and as I say, as I write, um, could you say that, that, you, there's some great music that you don't even need to hear to know it's good. Yeah, it, it's it's idiocy. It really is. Yeah, yeah. So so anyway, that's my that's my definition. I've tried to pare it down to its its real roots and, and bare bones to apply to what art is. It it must be visual. It must be creative. But also, I go on to to point out it also must be intentional. Mm. As I I think the the example I use is just because there's a splotch of, of mud on, on a wall somewhere that happens to look like Elvis doesn't, doesn't make it art and it can't be your art. You can't appropriate it as your art. I mean, that's, yeah. uh, that, that's, that's, that's disingenuous to, to yeah. do that. So, so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I like the addition of the intentional part um, here yeah. because, mm -hmm. because the things that we do in the picture plane have to be deliberate. Yes. And by conscious choice. And I and I know this from experience because, for example, I am personally lacking in skill a little bit when it comes like uh, to landscape and make, mm -hmm. if I want to make a space uh, in, the, in the picture plane, not very mm -hmm. good at that. So it's very different whenever I try to do something like that versus when I know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so like, so I can tell the difference when accidents happen when I don't know what I'm doing versus when I choose to do something because I know how to do it when I'm right. drawing the figure because I'm much more familiar with that. So, right. so uh, yeah, I, 
I really like that as part of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the characteristics or the definition of art, because yeah. I also agree that it should be that skill should absolutely and skill, you know, not not skill that comes from oh, like a genetic haphazard uh, accident of nature or something, right. but like something right. that you earned with practice by That's doing right. it. Right. A bunch of times. I go on. I go on. I go on yeah. to specify that that um, it has to be intentional. Um, mm. But but I'm not talking about the the micro accidents that happen in the process of painting, let's say, or drawing. Uh, I'm talking about the act, the, the, an entire accident that you would be that you would be uh, appropriating as your own. You know, mm. like that splotch on the wall. I didn't include uh, intentional. In the basic definition I had originally, but I, I took it out for two reasons. One, I was trying to keep it as simple as possible. Yeah. And also that the intentional part does fold into the word creative somewhat yeah. anyway. Yeah. So I just I just go on in a second line after the definition saying, and by the way, it, it must be intentional also, mm -hmm. just just to extra to be extra clarifying. But uh, that's I believe is probably a good basic bare bones definition of what art is that can be applied to any work that is being claimed as art. And you can write then and there. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I there, agree. of course, there are going to be those people who say, you know, that's, that's your opinion. And, you know, I think that, you know, sneezing in a handkerchief is the greatest art there ever was. Hmm. I, again, once, once you start, once you start, uh, widening definitions to the point where they become meaningless, it, it undermines the potential greatness of the field. Right. In this case, art. You know, it does. It doesn't do justice to the field itself to be that all-encompassing that you're going to include everything. Yes. Um. Yeah, I've been thinking a little bit about why is it that people want to usurp the term that way and i think you know and of course sometimes it's to mock it or something because of um i don't know because i guess of the gatekeeping that you were talking about earlier mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I, but i also think i also think that it's because we you know humans we know that it's important and so i also think that sometimes what the people who want to usurp the term I also think that their intention is that they want to ascribe that importance to that, to that which they're calling art, because they think it's important. Um, I mean, that doesn't make what they're calling art, it doesn't make it art, but I think that might be kind of like the intention behind them wanting to be like, oh yeah, my life, it's art. I mean, you know, because yeah. we know that art is important. And so mm -hmm. by calling, I mean, it's kind of like a naive, sort of thing to do, but I, I don't know. What do you think about that? Yeah, there, there, there are several, I mean, we're getting into psychology here and, and, and it's an interesting aspect to all this, especially in today's art. There, there are several different reasons that I've seen in this uh, that, that are deeply psychological. One, one is that for some people, for some types, there's an intimidation about, the, about people who have great skills you know, the skills of a Mozart or something. Mm. There's an intimidating factor to that that can be counterbalanced by the acceptance of work that doesn't require that. Mm. And it allows you to take a, a breath of ease that, okay, okay, all great art doesn't have to be of that high caliber and I, won't, mm. I don't have to be intimidated by it. It's really a lot easier in many ways. And then secondarily, there's that psychology that, well then, therefore, I can be an artist too. And as I, I think the way I worded in the book about that is that in this day and age where, where equality is such a, you know, such a big term and everything, that allows for everybody to think of themselves potentially as an artist. Because, wait a minute, it's not, it's not about these godly types, the handful throughout civilization who are able to, 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 through their skill, accomplish these things. No, 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 no. It's, it's a wider definition that includes potentially me too. <laughs> I it, it, you know what yeah, yeah. I, I could have come up with that idea of of you know taping a, a banana to a wall mm -hmm. and everybody saying yeah that's that's the the hottest new thing in art I don't I don't have to be Michelangelo mm -hmm. 
because mm-hmm. that's too intimidating. And also, n- not just intimidating, there's kind of a, the, I, I think there's a reverse smugness about it almost. You know, how, how, how dare society say that there are these titans? Mm. Is, it, is it equality or is it equity? Because I feel like equity is kind of the more recent, more uh, pungent yeah, w- kind well, of in the politi- yeah, I, I Yes, yeah, it could be. I, I mean, in the, in, in the political terms, the reason it's poisonous is because equality, by definition, means um, equality of opportunities, whereas equity right. is equality of outcome. So I, I right. guess both of them could be applied to this analogy we're talking about. Um, although I don't think yeah. it's necessary. I think the point is understood that, you know, you want okay. it, it, it's, it's, it's the, it's the old, it's the old human tendency of some to want to, to want to bring down the giant other people to their level. Yeah. To their level, because yeah, yeah. it's not about bringing them down so much. It's about by doing that, it brings me up to the same level. I really am on the same level yeah, yeah, as, yeah. Okay. as Leonardo. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, okay. Okay. All right. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the, uh, all right, just give me a minute. Cause we don't have really that much time. Um, mm-hmm. the, you said something about art not being functional. I mean, you didn't mm-hmm. specifically say art not being you didn't specifically say art isn't functional, but you said something, or I no, don't I remember exactly what it was. So yeah, could that. you talk about that? Okay. Um, you know, sorry, I keep referring to this book of mine. It's, it's not out oh, no. there for look at yet, but but I, I I give that definition of art and then follow it with some sub sub um, headings of that. One was as we were talking about earlier about it, it has to be intentional, mm. um, but I also add this thing about functional. Because when function gets in the way, uh, or I should say it this way, it, when function becomes an element, it can easily get in the way. Mm-hmm. It's part of the reason why architecture is very difficult to be called a pure art form because it needs to be functional. Mm. There, there, are, there, are, there are absolute needs in the design of a building. If you don't put windows and doors in it, yeah. It's not a building anymore. It's not a piece of architecture. And, and so knowing that there are those functional needs, it, it already hampers the purity of it being, a, you know, an art form uh, in, in the pure sense. So that's why getting back to art itself, if, if you're going, going back to the definition that it, that it needs to be visually creative, um, if the purpose of this creation that you're doing is in part to serve a purpose for something else as a function that undermines the purity of it. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm trying to be clearer here. I use, I use the idea of a traffic sign, right? Mm. A stop, a stop sign was designed by somebody, right? But it wasn't designed with the purpose of, of, of beauty. Mm. That wasn't its, you know, um, that wasn't its ultimate purpose. I'm going to design something. Uh, in red and white, that is the most beautiful red and white shape that I, I get. No, it, it was, it was, all of those things were chosen for a reason, a functional reason. And therefore, those were limitations to the creative process. So, so we can't really co- in, include those things unless you're Andy Warhol. And of course, of course you make, you know, 800 uh, stop signs on a wall and show it at, at Museum of Modern Art. Mm-hmm. Um, but as I mentioned before, another example would be like a, you know, a slideshow at a, you know, at a business meeting or something like that. I mean, it's not, it's not that these things can't have even beauty to them. I mean, there mm. can be an element of beauty to some of these things, but that's not their, their, their reason for existence. And, and, it, and, it, and it undermines the purity of it as an art form. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. All right, um, Mr. Florzak, what is beauty in your opinion? I have another uh, definition that I've pared down. It beauty is that which enhances and fulfills the senses, whether visual, oral, a u r a l, uh, mental or physical. 
it, 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 it's, that, it's that which captivates and enhances and fulfills the, the senses. So these, the, 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 the beginnings of beauty are hardwired in us. That's an interesting thing in itself. Um, they, they, they transcend culture and time mm -hmm. and what, as I, as I point out, um, is there really anybody in the world that wouldn't consider a, a, a cloudless day with blue sky and balmy temperature? Is there anyone who wouldn't consider that beautiful? Mm -hmm. Is there anyone who wouldn't consider a, a rainbow beautiful? Um, or a field of wildflowers? These are hardwired things which are important because it shows that at the very basis, we, we have a, a universal idea of what beauty means. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then, of course, as you go beyond that, it starts getting more you know, fractured into smaller elements and whatnot. But those things right there, uh, let's, let's take a, a rainbow. It, it, it captivates, it enhances, and it fulfills a sensory um, aspect of ourselves, the, the, the visual. Um, same thing can, can be said of, of things in the, in the oral uh, realms and, and even physical. I mean, you could, you could say that there are, that, that certain touch is beautiful. Right, uh, yes. That type of thing. So, so it's really, a, a, a beauty is a, sense, a, a sensual thing, really, um, that fulfills the senses in whatever sense we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, does that does that work for you? It does work for me. I'm reminded. I was reminded towards the end when we were just now talking about art uh, and function, and we, with, with what you're saying now about beauty, I'm reminded of Roger Scruton. Oh yeah, um, the great, great Roger Scruton. Yeah, yeah. Um, I for now I've only read his very short introduction to beauty, uh, mm -hmm. but I've also I've also listened to his lectures and mm -hmm. um you know on beauty and architecture architecture and mm -hmm. um i guess that was the other thing that i wanted to ask uh, towards the end about beauty and uh, or art and function but then i was like all right i have to we have to talk about beauty but he also talks about beauty and 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 i was reminded because of what you said about it being kind of like a sensual thing also like the pleasure aspect of it because mm -hmm. uh in his very short introduction he talks about how uh, I think it was like the Greeks that said how the beautiful is the good and the true. It's like these three things. But then mm -hmm. Struden mm -hmm. is like, but, you know, beauty is like, it, there's also like this lustful aspect and it, what, what will you do for beauty and stuff? So I, like it can make you do things that maybe are not good, you know, like if you, I don't know, chasing after a woman or something, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I thought that kind of having a value that had that possibility i guess seems interesting um so do, yeah. what do you what do you think about that do you think that possibility is within the aspect of beauty or do you think that beauty is purely a positive good thing yeah i'm not yeah i'm not sure it's funny uh, to pit me with um sir roger who is an, an ultimate hero of mine um although i think i think in his writing about beauty he goes farther than i feel he needs to he starts bringing, understandably, and it's fascinating, he starts bringing a moral component into it. Mm. And I'm not sure it needs that. Mm. There, there are, it, it, to me, it's almost like saying, is there such a thing as a beautiful woman? Yes, but what if this beautiful woman is used for pornography or, 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 or you know, that kind of thing? Well, that's true, but how relevant is that to whether or not she's beautiful? Right. You know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't fully, I don't even want to say agree with, uh, with Scruton because he's, he's, he's such a, a master of, of thought. Um, but I, I just, I just, in his writings on beauty, I don't think it was necessary to bring in those other components. Mm -hmm. um, beauty in and of itself is enough as a sensory issue, as a fulfilling sensory issue, whether it's to the eye, to the ear, touch to the mind even and you know uh you know a, a great um uh, couplet of words from a, from from shakespeare uh, can be unbelievably beautiful for the mind 
mm. uh, and um, serve the purposes of my definition. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, and, that, and again, well, just to quickly say, that's not sure. to say that, that Scruton's uh, interesting discussions about how that moves into other areas, especially the moral, aren't fascinating. They are. Yeah. I just don't think it's necessary for the, the purity of the idea of beauty and, and beauty alone. Hmm. Yeah, no, I, uh, I think I agree with that. I, I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's necessary. I, I also, I'm not sure if I think it's relevant. Um, mm -hmm. I like, I like, I personally like the idea a lot of beauty as an ideal to mm -hmm. which yes. to aspire. That's it. Um, yeah. And, 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 mm -hmm. uh, and, and I also like the overlap of that with skill because it is, you know, artistic skill because it is right. through, it's like the skill is the ladder with which you try to get to the ideal, you know, because it's a well, height also, that you're going to get to, you know. Also, I, I, where I mentioned before with the definition of art, then I have like a secondary subheading of things. With beauty, what's interesting is that it's also connected to perfection. And both those things figure into the arts of the centuries that we were talking about all the way up until the end of the 19th century, where the artists were aiming towards perfection, even though they, they fully knew that they'd never be able to achieve that. But it was, it was the, the attempt along the way, the results of the attempt that made the work so beautiful. Mm. Because they, they, there was a, they, they, they didn't separate beauty from perfection. Yes. And, and that's, why, that's why I say, uh, uh, along with the definition of beauty, is the idea that it's, it's, it, it goes in harmony with the idea of perfection. Mm. A, a rainbow, can, can you improve upon the rainbow? No, it's perfect. Right? Mm, yeah. Can you okay. improve upon a clear blue sky with mild temperature? No. No, it's it beauty and perfection go hand in hand. And that and the, and those artists they they a lot of them spoke literally about that that I my life is dedicated to trying to reach perfection. And and of course in many you know many avenues today that's just looked down upon and scorned and, all that kind of thing. What is, what is perfection after all anyway? You know, these, these questions yeah. that will end up, you know, you go into the middle of the night discussing in college and, you know, but, you know, it's, it, it, these are wonderful, these are wonderful concepts that used to be important. Yeah. Which is what Roger Scruton was doing. He was trying to bring that, that, that subject matter back into the discussion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think, um, I don't remember. I don't even remember how exactly I came upon him, but I was like, "Oh, this is cool." I saw his. Uh, it's a documentary that he did, I think, for the BBC, mm -hmm. where what's it called? The importance of beauty or something. The I don't importance know. Importance of beauty. That's right. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And actually, that's the other thing that I wanted to talk about with uh, art and function. That his his uh, in his opinion, it was it's that uh, function follows form not the other way around exactly well um yeah i don't think he actually wrote in those terms and i hope he didn't because i read a lot about him because i use that exact phrase in my own <laughs> book when when talking about the bauhaus uh, and the, yeah, and the yeah. awful architecture and, and artwork that they they produce and their and their famous phrase was form follows function yeah 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 no and, was, and which, the, yeah yeah which, which is a horrible thing when you think about it i it's, agree i agree Mm -hmm. Well, by the uh, way, yeah. that, that phrase is exactly, you know, that, that, that figures right into what I was talking about, about art. Not, it, it cannot be a functional uh, uh, enterprise uh -huh. you know, because then it becomes something else. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, uh, Mr. Florzak, we have uh, gotten to the 50 minute mark of our conversation. Mm -hmm. Um. So I'm going to start to close it out here. Um, why don't you um, talk about, is there anything you want to add? Where can your work be found? Uh, when is this book going to come out? Where will it be available? Do you mm -hmm. want to add anything? Um, this book, it has just been finished. And um, I've ha I have several people uh, 
reading through it at the moment before we do anything with it. And I, I have a publisher in mind for this one already. So it's so early in the process that I, 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 I couldn't even say when and how and whatever that's coming out. But, but uh, hopefully it'll be soon and, and it will, it's going to, uh, I imagine it's going to stir up some interesting conversation. I hope it'll piss people off. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I don't think I have to hope. I'm, I'm sure it will. But I'll, and I'll tell you why I know that. If you, um, if you look at uh, the PragerU uh, videos that I've done on, you, if, in, on YouTube alone, I mean, they're, they're in a lot of different uh, in, in other areas too, but where you can see comments by the public, mm. it's amazing some of the things people say. I never respond to any of that stuff ever. Sure, yeah. Um, but, but, the, but it's, it's instructional. It really is to read these things. Um, it, 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 it keeps you close to your enemy, as they say, you know, the old phrase about you want to keep your enemy close so you know them. Uh, but it's amazing some of the things people say, and they will get pissed off, which I don't understand. I mean, I mean, these are just opinions. Uh, you know, these are, I mean, I think they're in, you know, in my case, I'm trying to, I'm trying to make a case that it's more than opinion, but you know what I mean? These are just just my thoughts on something, and I don't know why it would piss anybody off. I'm not telling. I'll tell you what. What happens a lot is being misheard. That is oh, really yeah. annoying, you yeah. know. And and a lot of people will say, you know, who are you to tell me what I should like? Well, I'm I'm not telling you that. You know, right. <laughs> you can like whatever yeah, yeah. you want. Or the other one that's worse is, you know, the Nazis did this in Germany in the in the 1930s. Um, you know, censoring art. They 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 thought it was. A, and I, I would never be for banning artwork. You know, I, when I, when, ha when have you? I mean, when did you even talk about that? Uh, anyway? Never, right. never said it's it's heard that way by people who aren't listening clearly. You know, um, and it's it's just not the case. So that's that's a that's an interesting thing to see. But it's good to, it's good to 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 read these things because. It gives you an idea of who the public is out there, and you have to have sure, sometimes yeah. you have a pretty thick skin, and those will probably be the readers that I don't, you know, who, who aren't writing their critiques of because it's not on the internet to write critiques about. But they're they're out there; they'll be out there, and they'll be pissed off, I'm sure. <laughs> and okay. uh, as far as my own work, I mean, it, it's just uh, you know, I have a website that you can look at work on there, robertflorzak.com. And uh, I'm around and, and um, going from one project to another. Okay. Yes. All right. That sounds great. All right. So um, thank you everyone for watching and listening. Special thanks to my guest, Robert, for agreeing to talk to me and uh, for his time. If you'd like to support Robert, my podcast, myself, or all three, all corresponding links will be in the caption or video description. Make sure you like this video and leave a comment so we know you are here with us. Also remember to subscribe to my audiovisual channel and see you next time everyone. Bye.